Hi, my name's Connie and you're watching a video measurement of strabismus, prism cover test. As I've mentioned earlier, the prism cover test is the gold standard test utilised to measure the size of a deviation. So as such, you should perform it in all of your patients, except for those who don't meet the criteria for the PCT or the prism cover test. And that is young children who don't have um, sufficient cooperation or infants also, and individuals with poor visual acuity in one eye. As you'll see in a moment, we require the patient to alternate their fixation and this requires you to be able to see the target to do this. So patients with very poor vision are unable to perform the PCT. Okay, before we proceed, I just want to clarify that when I am talking about the prism cover test, I am discussing what is also in some textbooks referenced as the prism alternate cover test. And the reason it's the prism alternate cover test is because we incorporate the alternate cover test as part of this assessment. You'll recall that the cover test has those three components, the cover, uncover, and alternate. So it's the alternate component component, that third component that we incorporate, which means that the prison cover test is a fully dissociative test. You cannot allow your patient to be binocular at any point in time. Now, to perform the test, you'll require obviously a prison bar. You can also use single prisms if you wish, and you'll need an occluder, and you'll ask the patient to fix on a target. It is best that you ask your patient to look at an accommodative target. So at near, small font, in the distance, the smallest letters they can see on the chart. And the reason you do this is so that you're able to control the accommodation as best possible. If you don't have control of that accommodation, there may be variability in the size of the deviation that you measure. So, best to use letters if you can, and then if they're young children, then you're going to have to use pictures and so forth. But again, uh, ask them to identify components of those pictures so that you're requiring them to constantly utilise their accommodation or constantly trying to control that accommodation. Okay, so how do we perform the test? Let's take a look at the first image. Here we can see the patient has a right esotropia. Now, generally speaking, before you proceed to a prison cover test, you will have performed a cover test. So you will know if the patient has a manifest deviation or a latent deviation or a combination of both. Now, the prison cover test can measure both latent and both manifest. But... Because it incorporates the alternate cover test as part of the assessment, it cannot distinguish what you are actually measuring, whether it's the manifest or the latent component. So this information is coming from your cover test. Your cover test will indicate we have a right ET, and so when you go to record your PCT, it's clear that what you've recorded there is the recording of how large that right esotropia is. So the prison cover test goes hand in hand with the cover test. You perform the cover test first, you establish what strabismus is present, and then you go and measure it. So here in images B and C, we're seeing the alternate cover test being performed. And what we see is that confirmation that the patient can fix with the right eye and can fix with the left eye. So as the cover comes on, the right eye takes up fixation, moves out, and then, um, as you recall, underneath this cover, the left eye will be in. So as you go to cover this eye, this eye will now move back out to take up fixation. Okay, so the first three images, or A, B, and C here, are depicting that you've got strabismus, you perform your cover test, and then you're proceeding to the prism cover test. So for the prism cover test, we always put the prism in front of the deviating eye. If you have an alternating strabismus, in concomitant strabismus, you can put it in front of the right or the left eye. It won't matter, so you can choose uh, on that occasion. But otherwise, if you have a preference for fixing with one eye over the other, then you would always put the prism in front of the deviating eye. In this instance, the patient prefers to fix with the left, so we put it in front of the right. Okay, and then we proceed to do an alternate cover test. 
So you can see here the prism is over the right eye, cover is over the left, and then it moves over to the right and then over to the left. So we're doing that alternate colour test. It is important that during the entire test the patient remain dissociated and that you do not allow the patient to be binocular during the PCT. Now during testing what you need to do is observe the eye under the prism. And what you're looking for is neutralisation of movement or what we call the null point. You will find a prism which results in the eye under the prism no longer moving to take up fixation. So what do we mean by this? Here, when you cover the left eye, you see the eye move out to take up fixation. Now, when the prism is put in front of this eye, you will reduce the amount of movement. And at the point which you find the prism that equates to the size of the deviation, there will be no more movement of that eye. And if you go beyond that prism, what you will see is reversal of the strabismus. So in this instance, it's an esotropia, and we see the eye moving from in to out. If you exceed the size of the deviation with the prism, you will start seeing the eye go from out to in. And it is actually a good idea that you come to the null point, which is no movement, you exceed it, which is an overcorrection, and that confirms to you that the prism below that was indeed the null point or the size of the deviation. Okay, now let's go through why is it that you're reducing the size of the deviation through putting this base out prism for the esotropia. And let's take a look at the second image here for this. What we have here is a left esotropia, so the opposite of what we have in the first image. And we have the left fovea fixing on the target as the fixing eye. And the image is falling on the contralateral image point, which is nasal to the fovea, given that uh, we have an esotropia. So we'll put a base out prism in front of the deviating eye. We're going to move it towards the fovea. So here we see that we have a 20 doctor prism put in front of the deviating eye, but this is a 40 doctor ET. So this prism here is still an under correction. We haven't quite gotten to the correction of the ET. So here we have the 20 doctor prism in front of the left eye. The light deviates towards the base. And what we can see is that this was the original CIP, and now we've moved the image over here. So it's closer to the fovea. And when the patient takes up fixation, they're taking up fixation with the fovea. So the movement we'll see will be smaller. It'll be half of that that we saw earlier, given that we've got 20 diopters there. So once we put the 40 diopter prism in front of the eye, what we'll see is that this image will bend onto fovea, and as you perform the alternate cover test, there is no need for the eye to move because it's fixing on the target. You've actually moved the ray of light onto the fovea. Now, earlier I mentioned that you'll see the opposite if you overcorrect. Well, if we now put up a 45 prism doctor, what will happen is that the image will fall beyond the fovea over here. And so now you've got the image falling on temporal retina, and so the movement that you'll see is what simulates an exo-deviation, which is out to in. So the premise of this test is essentially to move the image through the prism towards the fovea, and when you find the prism that puts that image onto the fovea, there will be no longer the requirement for the patient to make a movement to take up fixation because it is fixing with the fovea of the deviating eye. To make it easier for you during testing, I suggest again that when you see your patient, you estimate using Hirschberg's the size of the deviation and you commence your testing with a PCT with that prism. So if you estimated that it's 30 doctors, you start at 30. And then you see what the movement is and you move up or down accordingly. So if the 30 is an undercorrection, you increase. If the 30 appears to be an overcorrection, you decrease the prism bar. Okay, now one of the issues we have with prisms is that the sets that we have in our clinics usually only go up to about 45 or 50 doctors, which is about 25 degrees. 
There are, however, obviously our terms that are larger than this. What do we do when we have a patient where you've reached the end of your prison bar and the patient is still uncorrected? We can stack or split prisms. What stacking means is that you put one prism on top of another. Splitting prisms means that we actually add a prism to the fixing eye. So what we would have is one in front of the deviating eye and one in front of the fixing eye. So we're creating an additive effect by adding a prism to the other eye. However, there is a problem. When we stack prisms or split prisms, you can't add the values of the prisms. So if I have a 30 doctor prism and stack on top of it a 20 doctor prism, 30 plus 20 is 50. However, due to the nature of prisms, it isn't actually 50. So we have to use tables that tell us what that um, stack of prisms equates to. And here is a table for stacking prisms. So here we'll see that if we take a 30, and this is the column for the 30 here, and we take a 20 prism doctors, here is the intersection here. It equates to 66 prism doctors. So we can see that obviously it's not 50, it's 66. So always be mindful that if you're going to stack or split, you need to use your tables to be accurate in terms of documenting the size of the deviation. There's also a separate table for splitting. Let's use the example again that we have a 30 and a 20 prism doctor. So let's say the 30 is in front of the right eye and the 20 is in front of the left eye. So 30 and 20. And here is the intersection at 53. So in this instance, we have a 53 doctor prism if we split a 30 and a 20. So we can see here that splitting doesn't have as much of an additive effect as stacking. Okay, so when you're performing the prism cover test, we need to minimize errors as much as possible. And a couple of key things to do when um, measuring with a prism, know your prisms, whether you've got a glass or a plastic, and hold them accordingly to what they've been calibrated to. So for your glass, hold it in the prentice position, for your plastic, hold it in frontal plane. Don't tilt your prisms when you're measuring as that will create errors. Always remember to use your tables when you split or stack prisms and it's preferable that you split uh, rather than stack for, for very large deviations. Also and finally, always control your accommodation during testing. In terms of recording the prism cover test, we would indicate PCT for a prison cover test, or in some instances you may see PACT. Indicate whether you used glasses or not, uh, the distance far and near, and then the size of the prism that neutralized the deviation. So we've got 16 prism doctors base out, six doctors base down, and for near 30 doctors base out, six doctors base down. And we also indicate which eye was the fixing eye. So this is the eye that was or did not have the prism in front of it, which tells us that the prism was in front of the right eye in this instance. Now, even though I don't have the cover test result here, I can tell just from the PCT what deviation we had. There's a base out prism that's been used for both near and far. So both near and far, we have an ESO deviation because base out corrects for an ESO deviation. And We've used a base down in front of the right eye, which means the right eye was up. So we have a right hypertropia, or hyper deviation, I should say, because the PCT cannot distinguish whether we have a manifest or a latent deviation prism. All we know is that we have a 16 prism doctor ESO deviation and a 6 doctor hyper deviation of the right eye. Okay, the second recording here is exactly the same as the first, except that the plus here indicates we have an ESO deviation. If it was an EXO deviation, we would use minus. Also, the orthoptist here has indicated what the vertical height was. So we had a right on left, the right eye was higher than the left, and it's a six diopter um, vertical deviation. So here we're not actually indicating whether the base was up or down, um, or in or out, but we're simply 
indicating what the deviation was with the plus being ESO and the vertical being distinguished whether it's a right on left or left on right. And just before I conclude this video, I want to make one more point given the example we have here. In this recording, we have a patient who has both a horizontal and a vertical deviation. What do we do in these instances with the prism cover test? Well, we can actually stack a vertical and a horizontal prism, one on top of the, one on top of the other, so that we can neutralize the deviation, both the horizontal component and the vertical component of the deviation. Now, when we stack a horizontal and a vertical prism, we actually do not need to go back to our tables. We only need to go to our tables if we stack two prisms that are in the same direction. So two base outs, or two base ins, for example. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.